Brilliant. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to our guest, whom I will introduce more formally in a minute. Welcome to everybody who's in the room. Uh, we have plenty of people on Zoom as well, I'm told. So um, very, very happy that you could all join us tonight. This is the School of Public Policy's annual lecture. Um, and because we're a very creative school, we're going to have a lecture that is not a lecture. Um, Zani and I are going to have a conversation, but you cannot fault us for lack of ambition because the topic is not small. The future of liberalism, something that we will dispatch in about 45 minutes, um, and we will settle all possible issues surrounding the future of liberalism. But I have to say that I am particularly happy and particularly honored, and we all should be, that Zani Minton Barrows, the editor in chief of The Economist, has come to do this non lecture lecture. Um, uh, I will confess that we've been trying to get Zani to join us for an event for a while, and last spring we were about to do it, and she sent me an email the night before, and she said, I can't come, I can't tell you why. So I scratched my head, I wondered, why is it that Zani, uh, you know, has. Uh, uh, gone someplace else uh, at the last minute, not like her. Of course, when on Friday, my issue of The Economist came to my doorstep, I learned where she was. She was in Kiev interviewing a gentleman by the name of Zelensky, okay? So, you know, if anybody ever had a good excuse for not showing up at an LSE event, I think that is probably the best excuse ever. So you are forgiven, and we are very, very happy to have you here today. So my instructions in terms of um, practical stuff, Twitter users, uh, if you are tweeting, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE public policy. Phones on silent, please. The event is being recorded. It will be a podcast later on. So um, let us try to prevent ring, ring, ring. We will have a conversation and then we will open it up to Q&A from all of you, including people who might be on Zoom. And after the event, we will have a drink or two uh, outside. So if you'd like to have a chat with Zane, I, at some point I'm going to grab her and take her to dinner, but uh, uh, if you're swift enough, you may have a chance to uh, share a drink and, and some conversation. So um, I'm not going to do a very long presentation of our, of our guest of honor tonight, but not only is she the first editor in chief of The Economist, she is the first woman to have had that job in how many years? hundred and some? Um, 100... Not the first editor. Okay. Um, 17th. Okay. I mean, of course, <laughs> of course. She's 17th in the job, the first woman uh, in 178 years, did you say? Yeah. That the newspaper, um, The Economist is always keen on calling itself a newspaper, which the world finds puzzling. Um, but uh, it has been around for 178 years. Zani has an undergraduate degree from Oxford. Uh, she was a Kennedy Scholar at the Kennedy School at Harvard University, where I had the pleasure of meeting her. She was a bit of a Jeff Sachs protege. I was a bit of a Jeff Sachs protege back in the 1980s and 90s. And of course, since then, she's had a stellar career. She worked at the IMF for a while. She participated in a number of those Harvard-led missions to stabilize the economy in places like Poland, uh, led by Jeff Sachs. And of course, she's been at The Economist for quite a while. She was the business aff uh, affairs editor. She uh, led on the coverage uh, of emerging markets, among many other things. So I had the pleasure of speaking with her when she was writing those big special reports that they uh, used to have and still have on um, emerging markets and pretty much any other important uh, topic under the sun. So we are particularly pleased that she is um, here with us tonight. So let's go into the... Um, into the meat uh, of the evening. Um, sorry, vegetarians, it's probably not the right metaphor nowadays, uh, to the core content of um, the, uh, the evening. I thought that the future of liberalism might be uh, a, a suitable subject for a number of reasons. The first one, of course, is that liberalism is important, or I think, at least I think it is, and it seems to be in a bit of trouble. But in addition, uh, The Economist did a big series on liberalism a couple of years ago, in which there were some pieces by um, Economist staff, including some by Zani, but also you had guest pieces and you had uh, a number of sort of special issues on bits and pieces of what 
broadly might be considered liberalism. So uh, it is not as though we came to the topic last night. Zani has been thinking about it, reading about it, and of course, interviewing uh, uh, some of the big players in the world, friends of liberalism and, and uh, maybe not such good friends of liberalism. So what is liberalism? Uh, we could uh, spend a week here um, talking about it, but before I turn to Zani with my first question, let me just say that at least in my book, liberalism is four different things. Uh, liberalism, first of all, is a political philosophy, which emphasizes human freedom, human dignity, personal autonomy, individual rights. Secondly, liberalism is a form of government. Not only do we have democracy in the world, we have liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is majority rule plus individual rights and particularly rights for minorities so that majorities don't get to do as they please. Thirdly, and this is less scientific, but I think equally important, Liberalism is a temperament, sort of an ethos. Um, you know, Isaiah Berlin probably provided you know, the best definition. I'm sure you're all familiar with the fox and the hedgehog. The hedgehog knows one big thing. We foxes know lots of little things. So we're not quite sure exactly of what it is that we know. That's, I think, not a bad description of the liberal mentality, style, ethos, temperament, call it what you wish. And last but not least, at least in my book, liberalism is a, an approach to economic policy and economic reform. Exactly the kind of thing uh, that we teach you here. Gradualist, evidence-based, you know, we don't simply jump into the policy. We think about it, gather evidence, run some regressions, all that lovely stuff that you have been doing in your problem sets. Um, now, um, it all sounds good to me. The question, however, is not whether it sounds good to people like us at institutions like LSE or Oxford or Harvard. The question is what the world thinks about liberalism. And so my first question to Zani is, you know, liberalism seems to be under attack. Um, a, three or four years ago, right before the pandemic, the FT um, published a big piece in which um, the interviewee was a man called Vladimir Putin. And Putin basically declared liberalism dead. Liberalism, um, he said, was against the interests of most people. And, uh, you know, we had to sit and wait for the whole thing to collapse. Now, you might think that, um, you know, people like Putin would say that, right? You know, an illiberal dictator would not sing the praises of liberalism. However, Putin is not alone. Um, you know, someone like Donald Trump, a very different person from a different, very different country, said things about democracy and individual freedom, which are not so different from what the things that Putin is saying. And of course, if we look at you know, public discourse, populism, authoritarianism around the world, um, you know, liberalism seems to be sort of in a corner. So my first question, Zani, and I've probably gone on for too long, is, is there a crisis of liberalism? Uh, should we worry? And if so, what kind of crisis is it? Well, first of all, um... Let me turn this on. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm, I'm so, somewhat shocked that so many of you have, have um, come to join us this evening. Uh, and thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm now going to show that I'm probably sufficiently too innumerate to even be doing to running The Economist because it's actually 179 years. We were founded in 1843, just for the record. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, you know, liberalism is a capacious creed. And it, and I actually thought your four tenets were, were pretty good. Um, I like to think of it, and I, I would, those of you who are really interested in liberalism, is a fantastic book um, written by Edmund Fawcett, yes. who's a former colleague of mine, uh, uh, History of Liberalism. And he sort of draws from the many different kinds of liberalism, and there are many different kinds, four sort of key tenets, which are mm -hmm. not dissimilar to yours. Um, you know, society is a place of conflict and debate, and debate proves produces reform and produces progress. And that's sort of one tenet. The second is a belief that society is dynamic and can get better. The third, and this is one that you didn't focus on so much, I think it's a mistrust of power, a distrust of power. Liberals really are distrustful of power. And fourth, of course, the- I, I used to be a politician, so I could So you like be, power. I could not yeah, be yeah, distrustful yeah, like of power. power. Uh, and then of course, the insistence on, on, on equal civic respect for individual and thus the importance of personal, political and property rights. And I think that broad, sense, which we, because we thought Edmund's um, description was perhaps a little bit too long, in our essay that you, you uh, described, 
um, narrowed to a universal commitment to individual dignity, open markets, limited government, and faith in human progress brought about by debate and reform. That's what the core tenets of liberalism are. And if that's the core tenets, it is absolutely not obsolete. Absolutely not. I am complete. Those, those tenets are as important as they have ever been. Um, liberals have always, throughout their probably 200 year history of this creed, um, been concerned about the threats posed to liberalism. And so I don't think this is particularly more of a crisis than we've had in the past. And liberal, liberals, and well, I'm sure we'll come to this, liberals have been very good at adapting to changed circumstances. The precise sort of policies that liberals adhere to have changed over time, will continue to change. And there are now very, very broad things. I mean, you know, le center left, American progressives call themselves liberals, Hayekian followers call themselves liberals. So to, to kind of tie liberalism to a set of policies, I think is tricky because it's such a broad church, but this belief in progress, the belief in debate, the absolute focus on the individual and individual's rights. I think those are the, the key tenets of liberalism. And no, I don't think, I think the fact that Vladimir Putin said that almost ipso facto suggests that- um, That he couldn't possibly this, be right. No, he's absolutely <laughs> not right. Now there are challenges facing liberalism and I'm sure we'll come to them from both sides of the political spectrum. And actually one of the reasons there are these challenges now, and I think this is something that we sort of, a theme that came through when we wrote about, and I, and I wrote that essay in 2018, it felt to me that liberals had become complacent because particularly economic liberalism has been the sort of dominant um, paradigm of the last 30 years. Uh, and there was a view, I think, that free markets, democracy, um, moves towards more open societies was the sort of, was clearly the right direction to go, that liberals and particularly the liberal elite became somewhat complacent. And I think that that complacency is actually part of the problem of liberalism. And I, and I hope we talk about that, but, uh, the answer, no, it's not obsolete, it's as important as it ever was. And just in the last year, in Europe, in Ukraine, we are seeing one of the reasons why liberal principles are as important as they've ever been. I'm, I'm more, you know, I, I've been a liberal all my life. I studied PPE, not nearly as rigorous as what you're learning here, but I um, learned my liberalism under Michael Frieden, who's a fantastic um, liberal thinker. And I have never lost the faith in those liberal tenets. Um, I, I began, as you kindly said, my sort of professional life working with Jeff Sachs in Poland. I was there in Warsaw sort of months after the Solidarity government was, was, um, came to power as the moves, the shock therapy moves towards a free market were made. Now we can argue about whether there were mistakes made. Of course there were mistakes made, but basically I saw and what happens when you free up an economy? And it set me on a course that's you know, lasted throughout my professional life. I think when I was I at The Economist, when I first came to see, I think I was writing pieces on, on Chile and, yeah, and how, yeah. I, I, and you know, that sense that reform is possible, progress is possible, the rights of the individual are absolutely central, property rights are essential, limited government, that sort of stuck, stuck with me all, all the way through. And I think that's as important as it ever is. So let's stick with Poland or with the, the era that took you to Poland. Um, there are two kinds of threats to liberalism. Some come from outside, some come from inside. So let's begin with the outside. In those days when you were working for Jeff Sachs and so was I, uh, it was sort of the dawn of democracy, right? Eastern Europe. I think the Greeks might have something to say about that. Right? Yes, yes. Um, well, it was a dawn of yeah, democracy. No, I don't there have been many dawns of democracy, but uh, you know, a not small chunk of the world, Central and Eastern yep. Europe, went democratic. Uh, my part of the world, which had been democratic in the 20th century, then had very ugly, nasty dictators. We went democratic again. So you know, the Economist Intelligence Unit has a, an index of democracy. It shot up, but beyond the numbers, the feeling that you had in in Prague or 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 in Warsaw or in Brasilia or in Buenos Aires or in Bogota or in Santiago was, you know, you guys weren't there at the time. Let me tell you, it was intoxicating. It was amazing. I mean, you recover democracy and you feel really good. And if you're from Latin America, you party for several days to celebrate. Um, uh, I suppose the Poles did too. Nonetheless, people don't seem so enamored of democracy anymore. And if you believe people like Yasha Monk, you know, the younger generations in particular are not too keen on democracy. So if 
liberal democracy is one of the four pillars, at least in my definition. How come our generation, you know, had that moment of dawn? Granted, the Greeks had one before, and somehow it's been downhill from there. Well, let me let me first put a little sort of codicil to your mm -hmm. umbilical linking between liberalism and democracy, because okay, the okay. original classical liberals in you know the, the mid nineteenth century. Uh, were actually somewhat skeptical of majoritarian rule and somewhat right, skeptical, right. certainly of, of more mm -hmm. democracy. And, and I'm, I'm not sure whether I'm proud of this, but the economist in its early years was quite skeptical of extending the franchise to women, for example. I mean, there was, right. a, there was a sense that you, it was representative democracy by property men in the 19th century, which of course we look back property now- with, White men. Yes, we look back with considerable um, chagrin. Right. But I, I raise that, because liberalism is really grounded in the individual and the rights of the individual. And that was wedded sort of over the course of the 19th century to a belief in um, you know, democratic rule. But it is a quite skeptical of majoritarianism. And so it's, you know, there are highly illiberal people who can say that they are democratic, Viktor Orban being exactly. an obvious example. And so illiberal democracy is not an oxymoron, actually. No, absolutely. Um, but, but in my defense, I did say liberal democracy. You did, right? You did. Uh, but um, I, 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 I mean, I raise that because when some of the the debates about skepticism of liberal democracy mm -hmm. or skeptic are actually by sort of majoritarian types, right, and right. and I I agree with you that there are there are sort of various things going on. One, I think that there is a sort of malaise about the sort of sense of progress in lots of lots of parts of the advanced world. You know, you see these, particularly Pew does these um, polls right. which ask right. whether, your, whether you think your children will be better off than you are. Right. And in, you know, large numbers of countries, majority of people don't think their children will be better off. France is particularly pessimistic on this count. Um, if you are in that kind of a world, then I think you feel malaise at the status quo. And so you will then, people say, do you believe in democracy? Well, no, nothing ever happens here. Nothing gets done. I don't like, so I'm not sure it's necessarily a sort of thought through desire to have an autocracy. It's just a sense of frustration. It's dangerous. And, and there's no doubt that, that those, all the economist intelligence units, um, measures of democracy going backwards are very worried. The other thing that causes that, if you look at the numbers, um, lots of authoritarians have used, particularly the pandemic, as an excuse to clamp down on individual freedoms and as an excuse to go backwards. Um, again, deeply worrying, but because I'm a, essentially a perennial optimist, I actually think there too, the last year in particular has been a sort of exhilarating antidote, not just the sense with the sort of what's happened in Ukraine, where you, you've really seen how people are determined to fight for their freedom and fight for their rights against naked aggression, but also how, you know, the, President Xi, and I know we're going to come on to China, sort of the wolf warrior diplomacy has lost China standing around the world. And then if you look, you know, Bolsonaro was booted out. Um, uh, President Erdogan doesn't look in such great shape in Turkey. I, I think it's, it's, you know, it's far too early to declare defeat. And I think it's, it's now is the time we're beginning to see actually people really wanting to stand up for the things that liberal Democrats believe in. No, I think that's not only right, but a very hopeful thought. And I have found, I'm sure we all have, what's been going on in Ukraine immensely inspiring and moving. Uh, I mean, it's a wholly different story, of course, but it took me back to, you know, I thought maybe the moment when one really loves democracy is when you lose it. Uh, you know, I, I come from a country where we had democracy for 150 years and we lost it. We had 18 years of very bloody dictatorship. And at that point, democracy seems like the one thing you want and you're willing to fight for it. And the Ukrainians, of course, have been tremendous. So I, I want to have a follow up question on that. But before we get there to first up, a question on the liberal bit of democracy, because one view is we need more democracy. Uh, and some people are saying that uh, because particularly on the left, they think democracy is too constrained, et cetera. But one sort of particularly subtle version of that, if we wield in, say, Danny Roderick here, or, or, or Yasha Mank, whom I quoted before, they, these guys would say that 
Liberalism is in fact doing democracy a disfavor. What do they mean by that? Is that we have so many constraints of majority rule. You know, if in you know, Europe, people can vote anything by the, the European Court of Justice or the European Commission or somebody or the ECB will say, oh, no, no, you can't do that. Um, I'll change continents. You know, Argentine voters may want to do ABC, but the IMF will not let them. So their view, I'm not sure I share it, but I'd like to get your sense uh, uh, on this point, is that enthusiasm with democracy is going down because democracy has become insufficiently democratic. And there's too many of these powers, the ECB, you know, whatever, the World Bank, the IMF, pick your favorite villain, that is constraining democratic will. And that pisses people off. So that's a version of the Michael Bird, we've had enough of experts argument. And I have a, I, I, I have great respect for Danny Roderick and Yasha Monk, but I'm, yeah. I think if you unpack this argument, I'm not sure it really holds up. And, and then those two examples are mixing slightly different things. Let's take the ECB and with Charlie Hill, let's take central banks in general. I mean, governments, sovereign governments, um, decided to devolve technocratic powers of monetary policy to central banks starting in the you know, early 1990s, the creation of independent right. central right. banks because it was felt that that would lead to better, technocratically better policies. Because politicians have short-term time horizons, they tend to you know, allow inflation to get out of control, so you have boom bust. But it was a decision made by democratically elected politicians that could be undone by democratically elected politicians, it's not some sort of you know, God-given right that central bankers should be independent. So I can't quite see why that's a diminution of democracy. And similarly, you know, the European Union was you know, created by sovereign states who then decide the ways that the European Union should be run and the role of the European Court of Justice and so forth and decide that that is a you know, appropriate way to run it. Again, I don't think that's a diminution of democracy. So I, I kind of find the logic of that argument not very compelling. Does it mean that you know, on occasion people in the UK will be unhappy about a decision made by the European Court of Justice? Probably. Does it justify the... the crass um you know simplification and um distortion of this during the brexit campaign no i mean it's absolute nonsense most of the arguments that were made uh, about the loss of control i mean we've now seen what it's like to get back control right i mean it's it's so get it back to have it slip away exactly so i i, I think there's a lot of um i don't buy this idea that it's sort of somehow undemocratic and un illiberal and undemocratic to be able to do this I, i'm not sure i buy it either, but I can see why if I were a populist, and we'll come to populism in a minute, this is a very juicy plum sparrow sitting there on the branch, right? Uh, uh, because it is very easy to tell people, look, you wanted to do A, and these bureaucrats in Brussels, all these bureaucrats in Washington didn't allow you. You know, it, it get, gives you a lot of political mileage. Yeah, of course it does, but it's, it's uh, you know, and in each case is slightly different. I mean, I think that there are you know, I'm not at all clear that you'll necessarily have independent central banks forever because they'll, the political winds may move the other way and politicians may decide they don't want that. But it doesn't mean that you know, forever sovereignty has been lost to them. No, I think more generally, there are lots of things that in democracies we choose not to decide democratically. When somebody is accused of a crime, we don't have an election to decide whether he or she is guilty or not, right? We want judges to be as unpolitical and as removed from the democratic process as possible. And central bankers are not quite that removed, but we want them to be removed as well. We want, we want the technocratic right? ability to reach goals that are set by politically right. accountable leaders. If you praise technocrats, the audience will get up and applaud. Um, this is a breeding ground for technocrats. Um, actually, when I, we, we, we discussed Michael Gove on the very day this school was launched, because I said to, you know, not these students, but the previous generation, I said, guys, you come to a place where experts uh, uh, are being trained, and we've just been told by a senior minister that Britain doesn't want experts anymore. Uh, um, but I think it's, it's interesting to sort of unpack it, though, because, the, you know, what these populist politicians are tapping into is a very real sense of dissatisfaction, right. whether it's the people who voted for Donald Trump, whether it's right. the people who voted for Brexit, people were cross right. and, and understandably cross about certain things. And of course, it's politically very appealing to blame technocrats, blame, you know, illiberal elites or whatever. But that also doesn't justify the other side 
not taking these actual concerns seriously. And I think one of the, one of the many um, challenges that liberals need to face up to is that you know, they need to understand why people were unhappy and kind of focus more on addressing those issues. So I do think there was, and this gets back to my sense that liberal, the liberal elite in particular had become a sort of slightly complacent, smug, self-satisfied lot. You know, globalization, whatever you want, the, the changes of the last 30 years from technology and globalization have created immense opportunities. They've also created immense challenges for a lot of people. And I think we, and I'll bring you into the liberal club here, um, were insufficiently I'm, I'm cognizant a, a of that. Member. And, and, and there is a degree to which there was you know, not enough introspection from liberals themselves. And I think, so there is, it's, it's not entirely as though we can deflect the blame. No, absolutely. I, I was gonna to come to this later, but we, we got onto this topic. So let's stay here for a minute. Liberalism and elite seem to be two words that come in the same sentence way too often for my taste. And uh, for a piece that I was writing, I began thinking, which are the presidents or prime ministers around the world that you could tag as liberal? And it's, you know, uh, a very qualified, very smart, but somewhat depressing list. Um, the president of France used to be a banker. is an upper middle class, highly educated man. The prime minister of Canada is also liberal and happens to be the son of a prime minister uh, and his mother was a celebrity. The president of Argentina, one president ago, uh, I suppose you could also call him liberal, and he was the heir to the third largest um, fortune in Argentina. And you know, on and on and on, you could cite 20 other examples. It, what is it about liberalism that it tends to recruit as the standard bearers, upper middle class, highly educated men mostly? Um, where are the working class liberal politicians? I mean, where's the HR department of liberalism? How come they're not doing their yes. job? <laughs> Well, they clearly need to recruit yeah, yeah, yeah. from here. I, I, I think you you draw... I, parenthetically, I forgot, of course, Hillary Clinton's comment about, you know, what was it? The despicables. No, it was not going to speak What was it? The, um, the, the yeah, deplorables. deplorables. Yes, the deplorables, right? Not exactly the kind of comment that gets you a lot of sympathy, right? Those deplorable people in the South who don't quite know what they're talking about. So let me sort of rewind to answer your question a little bit i mean what we've seen in the last that in this that sort of 30 year period of the you know liberal complacency and 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 time at the top of the pile is a remarkable return to skill globally and a huge widening of income inequality and we'll we'll come to that and a creation of a of an educational elite which i'm afraid you guys all belong to um uh of highly educated people whose belief in their own worth is probably reinforced by the sense that it's a, we're in a meritocracy and they you know, you've earned your success. Um, but that elite has done really very well out of these last decades. And so the system of economic liberalism um, that has created and sustained that elite becomes sort of somewhat self-reinforcing and and two there are there are many sort of parameters on which that liberal elite is actually not all that open to reform and liberal itself i mean right. you know liberal elites tend to work in uh things like you know, apart from public administration of course but uh you know lawyers whatever high doctors highly skilled professionals which often are not at all open themselves and often often rather closed and have their own barriers to entry um you know university admissions in the us is another one of my bugbears absolutely shocking legacy you know all of that uh these these kind of senses that they are creating a world which benefits them i think makes people outside that elite about it and rightly so and understandably so. How do you think about and, that? Uh, sorry, I didn't interrupt, but if you look at the UK Parliament, you look at say at, 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 at Labour MPs, half a century ago there were lots of people, you know, from working class backgrounds in the north of England who had been minors. Very hard to find people with that sort of background in, in the Labour benches today. What changed? What happened? Well, part of that is the trade union movement, the decline right, of the right. trade union but, movement. But it's probably the part same thing the in, say, in the SPD London. in Germany. It's probably, you know, um, isn't it the case in a lot of liberal left of centre parties across the world that the working class MPs sort of withered away and suddenly it's a bunch of people 
you know, doctors and lawyers and engineers and economists from elite universities? I mean, I think I think that the, for, for the left, I think that yeah. the trade union movements, yeah. Yeah. the weakness of the trade union yeah. movement is a large part of that, because that was the pipeline of a lot of those politicians. I think then there is a kind of self-selecting group, the, the kinds of people we've been talking about often tend to be people who disproportionately more go into politics. Right. Um, if you look at the, I mean, we don't want to make this too UK focused, but if you look at the Tory party, I don't know if you looked at all those MPs, whether you would put them all in this liberal elite <laughs> basket, you might not actually, there's right. a bunch well, of very different people. I would people. put them in the elite basket, I'm not sure I would put them in the liberal basket. <laughs> but so the answer I think is less about who the, the, who the politicians are and more the kind of thing that, right. They stand for and the ex life experience they have had yeah. and a sense that yeah. there is now a sort of meritocratic elite which is somewhat self-reinforcing and really quite distanced from from the rest of the population i think that's absolutely true and is a you know it's what trump who was hardly a man of the people but what trump tapped into of course, um, yeah. Yeah. people tap into that I, you know, I don't think that that's irreversible. Um, I think the problem if, we have right now is the lack of people within the If you were to suggest one, two, three, three quick policies to diversify the liberal elite, what would you suggest? Just get rid of legacy admissions. But that's what I mean, I mean the US, I, right? I just think, the LSE does not have such a policy. Yeah, no, the UK, um, I mean, it is nice. I mean, this yeah. is, this is, I'm sure this is getting far from the serious discussion of liberalism that you were expecting. No, no, but it's but very important. It is, in the, the end, this the is UK, what matters for politics. The UK, I spent most of my adult life living in America. Um, and my kids were born in America. I sort of know the US reasonably well. Yeah. The UK, for all its sort of, you know, reputation of being a place, fastest place, is so much more meritocratic than the US on so many parameters, particularly in the education system. Yeah, it's yeah. it's you know, well, night and day. Yeah. So that would be absolutely top of my list. Yeah. We do not allow people into the LFC simply because their parents went here and the rich. Um, I mean, we wish we had more rich people who gave us money, but that's a different I mean, question. I, mean, uh, 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 I think education uh, reform is part of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, I think having, we have an education system that was designed in the first half of the 20th century for an economy that is completely right. different than that. So, you know, it's almost become a slogan now, but lifetime learning really is the way that you need to think about preparing people for the 20th first century. Um, these kind of, it's easy to say these reforms, it's really, really hard to do them, but they are the kinds of, uh, let me give you a concrete example, because I was blown away by it a couple of weeks ago. I've just come back from a trip to Indonesia, um, where I spent five days rectifying um, what had been a rather alarmingly large gap between the importance of an economy and my knowledge of it. Um, and I, as, as part of this, spent some time talking to the education minister who used to be, who was the founder of Gojak, one of the big tech companies there, and they are in the midst of a very dramatic education reform where they've basically said to all the universities um, that they have an eight semester undergraduate curriculum, that any student can take up to three semesters doing work experiences at accredited companies and the university is forced to recognize those as, as credit. Now that is, there are lots of companies have signed up. Um, the universities get, the student is subsidized by the government that is sort of in, in a couple of years, very dramatically changing the nature of the higher education system. Right. Those kind of right. Right. radical right. changes right. are the sorts of things right. that we should be thinking about. And we're, we're just sort of incremental where we're not, and it's worth remembering that liberals are meant to be radical. That's the kind of the etymology of liberalism comes from that. Liberals are, they're not revolutionaries. We're not, we're not, we're not you know, going to stand on the ramparts and, and, and blow everything up, but, but the, the sort of whole sense of being a liberal is that you should be wanting yeah. progress, wanting to, agitating for change. Yeah. And I think part of the problem with the liberal elites is that we haven't been agitating for enough change because the status quo has been jolly nice for you know, people at the top of the pile. Absolutely. Actually, a former director of the LSE, Anthony Giddens, used to write about this and used to say that you know, liberalism as geography, you just happen to be in the middle, is the wrong definition for liberalism, because if you're in the middle, you're just willing and dealing, you have no ideas. And he advocated a more ideological liberalism, which was much more radical. Um, but that's very easy to say. Most liberals out there in the world don't, don't fit that. And, and liberals for most of the history of liberalism, if you so crudely say it's the last yeah, 200 yeah. years, were not in power 
they were on the outside right, agitating right, for change. Right, you know, the, the Economist right. was founded to fight for the abolition right, of the right, corridors. Right, right. You know, right. we were on the outside agitating for change. Conservatives are the people who are supposed to like the yeah, status quo. Um, yeah. And liberals are supposed to be agitating for change. And in some places, I think recently, the, the two have slightly swapped sides. Let me stay with this issue of what has given rise to populism for a minute. The standard narrative is that the economy stagnated, median wages are lower than they used to be uh, 50 years ago, inequality has gotten worse, and that gave us Trump, that gave us Brexit, that gave us les gilets jaunes, you know, pick and choose your favorite subject. My problem with that view, and I'd, I'd like to get your sense here, is that it is an entirely Anglo-American view of the planet. Why do I say that? Because if I draw up a quick list of the other countries where populism is in ascendance, India, Turkey, the Philippines, Brazil, Poland, Hungary, those are very different countries, but they have one thing in common. Their economies have grown like crazy. Brazil a little bit less so. Uh, and median wages certainly have not stagnated. And then many of them, not in all, in fact, the income distribution is much better. Um, you know, Barack Obama wrote a piece in the New York Times once saying that Lula was the most popular president in the world because, my God, look at how, you know, income distribution in Brazil was improving. So are we not being overwhelmed by the Anglo-American narrative and we are thinking differently about populism and sexual liberalism? Yes. I mean, but I don't think, uh, I think it would be, that's a very unidimensional view of what is causing okay. populism. And I think even in the US and the UK, that's too unidimensional of you. There is an element of what you, the sort of economic sense right, of being left right, behind, right. but a, an equally important and in many places more important um, factor, I think is the sense of uh, concern about the pace of change and loss of identity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that I think is, if you are looking at somewhere like Poland, um, it is, a sense that the country is changing very fast, the kinds of values that you associate with the place are changing. This, this morphs quite quickly into concerns about immigration, which it's not in every country, but in many places it's. And it's, it's a, I think, a sense that the country that I knew is not the country I'm in any longer. And I think that's frankly just as big a part of what happened in, in the US and indeed here as the, as the straight economic one. And only by understanding that sense of identity and, and the threats that people think are being posed to it by the pace at which the world is changing, that I think is, to me, the much more powerful, actually, than the, than the straight economic one. Now, the, I, I completely agree. I think the economic bit has been overemphasized. You're absolutely right to put identity in the middle of a conversation. For liberals, however, that's a very uncomfortable conclusion for a couple of reasons. First of all, because abstractly speaking, liberalism is very universalistic, you know, um, same rights, same obligations to everyone, whether a citizen of the same nation or not. So once you begin to say, well, yes, we're going to subsidize these people who happen to be on this side of the border, but not those people who happen to be over there, it's not quite sure how, what the liberal case for that is. Secondly, um, we liberalism, I mean, liberal, sorry, are for the free mobility of goods, <coughs> services, capital, and people, right? And, uh, you know, I, I used to have a teacher at Columbia who used to say, it's very easy to be a liberal and simply say, I'm in favor of the mobility of capital, piece of cake. The real liberal is somebody who says, I'm in favor of the mobility of people. But if your conclusion is right, liberalism is being undermined by a lot of, maybe excessive, maybe not, mobility of people. So that's a big conundrum. Uh, we love immigration, you know, you've been a migrant, I've been a migrant several times in my life, I've grown up in about 10 countries, so I'm all in favor of migration, but I'm sort of a bit of an oddball for most, you know, electorates in most places. How do we, how do we square that circle? So I think you point to something that's very real, and that there is a, you know, being, being a liberal is not always easy. Um, you know, I, I I've lost two elections, I'm painfully aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, <laughs> secondly, I'm not you know, it's, I don't think one should necessarily equate being a liberal with having to be in favor of, you know, uncontrolled immigration. I mean, I happen to be like you in favor of, you know, high levels of immigration. I think that countries benefit from that. Right. 
But if you go back, for example, in the early, very at the beginning of the 20th century, when Winston Churchill was a liberal, which he was at mm -hmm, that point, mm -hmm. he gave a very, very good speech in the House of Commons, arguing in favor of the, or arguing against the imposition of a, of a sort of very mm -hmm. tight immigration laws, right. would have been Britain's first one. And that whole debate about, you know, the nature of what being a liberal was and control of, of borders was, was very, right. was very opposite then. It's been opposite in the US. You know, right, the US has right. gone through periods of being very open to immigration and then completely slamming the door in the 1920s. Exactly. There is always going to be a tension there. I think the conclusion I've come to is that the only way you sustain political support for open uh, sort of immigration and high levels of immigration is by giving countries and and voters in countries a sense that they have control of their borders and that this is that this and is kind of managed lives. and control of their lives and so i'm i don't think it is illiberal to be in favor of managed immigration i happen to think that more is generally better but i think it is it is not illiberal to say that actually people are you know people are it's okay to worry about um, illegal migrants coming how do we do it point system People with PhDs, you know, people without PhDs out. There, you know, I think there's a there's there's no perfect. The point system has drawbacks. It has some advantages, but it has drawbacks. You know, skill based immigration is you know probably the right way to go. You may well this country actually needs more people, low skilled people as well as more high skilled people. I mean, this the conundrum that the UK finds itself in right now is a really interesting example of this. On the one hand, we've you know thanks to Brexit, we've taken back control. If you look at public opinions, um, people, voters actually on across the board are in favor of higher levels of immigration than the UK has right now. But politicians in both parties are finding themselves trapped and unable to really say that that should be possible. So you, you, the US is even worse. The US has what 11 million undocumented people living in the US is incapable of reaching a political consensus, even to, you know, formally regularize the dreamers, for example. It's, so there are, po political systems find it very hard to do this. The, it's some combination of, yes, um, controls on the number of people, but generous allowance of the number of people. I think another area which we haven't cracked is asylum systems and refugee right. systems. We had a system that was set up in the aftermath of the Second World War. Right. It's really not fit for purpose right now. We haven't, we haven't worked out what a sustainable right. way forward is. If, if liberals can't crack this, it's one of the weakest flanks because I think it is it it opens exactly to the arguments that you made. You, this was not among my questions, but I'm tempted to ask. If, if you could rewind history, mm -hmm. uh, um, say to 15 years ago, as a liberal, would you have changed immigration policy to make it less likely that Brexit would happen? Um, <laughs> you know, my... I think much more problematic than, I probably would have done what Germany did, which was to have a longer period before you had complete free mobility. But what I think was actually really toxic was the combination of free mobility and then the um, dramatic spending cuts that came with the Osborne austerity uh -huh. after 2009. Because I think what was a real killer was people going to their schools or to their doctor's surgeries and not being able to get appointments or not being able to get their kids into schools because suddenly there were tons and tons of people. So it was the combination. If you are going to have high levels of immigration, you have to make sure the public services are there for them. If you are going to have high levels of immigration and cut public services at the same time, it's a really toxic not, combination. Not perfect. I want to turn to the audience, but I have two quick ones. Well, we must mention China. Um, it's hard to think about any topic Less in the world today place. without China. And I want to put China in the category of sort of alternative to liberalism. Once upon a time, you know, um, when you and I are in university, um, the alternative to liberal democracy and capitalism didn't look too sexy. You know, there was Cuba, North Korea, Albania, you know, not really uh, 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 models that anybody wanted to follow. But today we have China. China, you know, used to be poor, it's suddenly upper middle income. China used to be weak, so it's suddenly strong. China used to be technologically backward, it's suddenly technologically advanced. So is the Chinese model um, an alternative to this beautiful thing called liberal democracy and liberalism we're talking about? Yeah, when were you last in China? I, 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 when were you last there? I, I think the shine 
if it was ever there, right. has gone off the Chinese model. China has become- Because last, of COVID policy? I think it's become under Xi Jinping, particularly in the last few years, right. ever more authoritarian. Right. And if there was a moment where it was seen as a model by other countries, particularly developing countries, I think that that looks much less um, pretty now. Right. Several yeah. reasons. Firstly, um, I think zero COVID has been a sign that an increasingly autocratic country finds it very hard to change course. Secondly, uh, the sort of capricious nature of the clampdown on the right. most sort of entrepreneurial and most successful part of the Chinese economy, which was its sort of tech sector, has meant that you know it's the most vibrant bits of the Chinese economy are looking much much worse. People are, you know, as I said, I just come back from Singapore and Indonesia. And right. In Singapore, you know, the numbers of people moving to Singapore to get out of China are huge. Oh, absolutely. Um, uh, and then thirdly, the you know the property yeah, yeah. bust is really dramatic. So I think the shine has gone off the Chinese economy. I, I'm I think China is a what, extraordinary civilization, extraordinary country, has huge potential. But I think the last few years have shown have not made it sort of its light shine brighter as an alternative model. And I think the simple answer is, you know, how many of you would emigrate to China if you could? I, mean, I think that's your answer about whether well, it's a place to let, 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 let me push back there. You are sampling from the wrong population, as statisticians would say. These are privileged people who have alternatives. But if you picked a bunch of underprivileged people and country X, Y, Z, I will not mention any country, so uh, I, I don't offend anybody. It's not so clear that people want to migrate to China. You know, go to the interior of Brazil, go to bits of India. You say, here's a ticket to China. Would you go, would you not go? I'm not sure. Well, we could do a little experiment. Um, I'm not. I'm not we have so to get, sure. Get Bill Gates to pay for I'm it. I'm not so sure. I think that um, I think there are elements of what China has achieved that people are, are super impressive. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the rapid pace of growth, the infrastructure system, so forth. Um, but as a model of government, yeah. I don't know. One last bit on China. I, I agree with what you're saying, but if I put on my, 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 my cap as a liberal, one liberal hope was that as countries A, progress, and B, become more integrated with the world, they would sort of inevitably become liberal. Uh, we have two observations that suggest otherwise, Russia and China, not small countries. Did we get that wrong? We, Western well, they're, liberals? They're, they're slight, I mean, the answer is yes, but they're slightly different. I, I certainly think in China's case, it, it wasn't, and I've gone back and you know read those speeches by reread those speeches right. by Bill Clinton. So, but right. there was a, a certainly an, a hope, morphing perhaps into expectation that as China grew richer and as it became more integrated in the world economy, it would become more liberal. Thus far, that has clearly proved been right. proven wrong. Right. Um, I'm still enough of a believer in the. Um, general superiority of the liberal approach that on a longer term horizon, I think we're, you know, wasn't it, who was it, which, which Chinese ruler said that it was too early to have passed judgment on the French Revolution? True and lie. True and lie. So I think, you know, it's too early yeah. to pass judgment on this yet. But exactly. so on a longer term horizon, I think that China may well end up not where it is now. We need at least 200 years. But in Russia's yeah. case, I don't think, I think it is a function of a country that is actually declining and has been frankly since the breakup of the Soviet right. Union and right. it is a so they're, they're in different right. positions right. it's not that it is you know so one okay. became a liberal out of success one became a liberal out of failure yeah so there are many ways of becoming illiberal guys my one last question uh, and then we will open it up to to the floor you are a journalist you run a very influential publication it is often said that one big cause for the rise of populism is fake news, misinformation, silos, and all that stuff that we have all heard. Um, there's a version of that that is probably too cheap but not worth spending much time on. But, you know, all these things that we've been talking about, identity politics, you know, concern about the speed of change, income distribution that gets bad or, or better, they've been around for a long time. And nonetheless, there seems to be a point 10, 15 years ago where, you know, we, we Latin Americans invented populism, by the way, we don't get the credit we deserve. And suddenly we had this non-traditional export going not only to places like, you know, Hungary, we went all the way to Washington, right? Pretty big achievement. 
So as a social scientist, I asked myself, what was the one sort of exogenous variable that changed? What was the big new thing that could have prompted this wave of populism? The natural candidate is, of course, the internet, social media, uh, and all of that. Do you believe that story? And as a journalist, how much do you worry about this? So I think there's some truth to it in the sense that I think the way in which the algorithms operate that put you into reinforce you know, what you're reading and therefore put you into completely separate worlds where people can consume their different kinds right. of news right. and live in right. completely different planets. Right. I think that that has you been a factor live off Fox them. News forever. Yeah, but Fox News right. is not so, Fox News is really interesting because it's not social media. Fox News mm. is traditional TV. Right. But, um, but I do think, because I was going to come on to that, I do think there is something. Like if you look, if you look at Brexit, for example, the role of Facebook, you know, the social media role was certainly clearly there. They, you can see it in the US. But, and then I would get to Fox News, it's, it's quite a lot of populism was driven by traditional media and indeed traditional print media in this country. You don't right. need to go to social media. And the other point, I'm, I think that there are these sort of moral panics about new media every time there is a major innovation in the media. So when the, you know, when the printing press was first introduced, you know, everyone was terribly worried that allowing, you know, the general populace, act, you know, access to books was catastrophic. It would, and you know, the same thing happened with the, when, when newspapers, national right, newspapers right. first came, you know, then radio, then TV. And I'm therefore not cataclysmically worried about this. I think that your generation is much more discerning of what you read than, than our generation is, and the generation coming after you will also be more discerning. So I'm I'm not worried that social media sort of inexorably means democracy is in decline, which I know you weren't saying, but people do say to me that, oh, isn't fake news gonna kill? I don't think it is. I think people will learn to, you know, adapt to a new technology. That said, it has it has made some difference, but I'm at the heart, I'm, I'm, I'm a liberal, I believe in progress and I believe in that we will through debate and, and through kind of striving continue to make progress. So I'm not willing to kind of write off and say, oh, fake news killed liberalism. I don't, I don't. Maybe, maybe that was, I should have added a fifth um, item to my list, belief in progress, a very liberal so thing. It's absolutely, well, yeah, do you know yeah. the, the economists, now I'm gonna test you, do you know what, our, what was written in our first issue and is published every week? I do not the know. Severe contest in context created to engage in severe contest between between intelligence which presses forward and a timid ignorance obstructing our progress. That's well, what we, we try to we, do. We we are soulmates because the um <laughs> the uh, the LSC the LSC has a motto of course which is all about you know finding truth for the benefit of society. So it's you know very much nineteenth century English. Liberals, that's cordial. One if kind you, or if, you, if yeah. you're a conservative, you you want to maintain the status quo, and that's it's a perfectly yeah, credible yeah. creed. But you basically yeah. believe in the, the importance of tradition and the status quo. If you're a you know communist or other revolutionary, you want revolutionary overthrow of the existing status quo yeah. because you know you you have to have a revolution. If you're a liberal, you 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 believe in the power of debate and incremental, radical but incremental change towards progress. You said that. Some were very discerning readers. I was thinking, I am not. I believe whatever the economist says. Um, well, all a, right. Terrible idea. <laughs> that. All right. Um, I'm really enjoying this. I wish I uh, could continue to monopolize the floor with Zani for the next five hours, but that would not be the right thing to do. So the floor is open, ladies and gentlemen. Back there was a first hand. Yes. Uh, there is a microphone. And if you could say your name and which bit of the LSC you come from. If you do, that would be wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a geography with econ student here at the LSC in my final year. And I'm also Polish, so I'm very interested in what you did in the 90s in Poland, but also how you spoke about Russia now. And I think um, I'd like to ask you both. I mean, you talk about Russia as a declining state, and I think I agree with that to a large extent in economic, political, and social terms. But I also come from a country in whose territory two anti-racket missiles landed last week killing several people. So while it might, might be a declining state in various terms, I think it's a very real threat right now to security globally as well. And I was wondering how you sort of see this going and how you can sort of, I don't know, how do these two perspectives align? I mean, of NATO and uh, the West widely saying um, isn't able to deal with Russia with, with been using various sanctions for the past 10 months. 
but we're still calling it a declining state. So how do we sort of couple those two views? Thank you. So I think, I mean, I think you raise a very important both question and point, and let me sort of try and explain. I think strategically and in, on a longer term horizon, Russia on its current trajectory is not just a declining state, it'll, it's, sort of, it's on a trajectory towards ultimately being a failing state because it is a, you know, increasingly, no, I don't use the word Stalinist lightly, but it's a di yeah. dictatorship that is tightening the noose with no strategic, it's strategically it's already lost, right? It's lost its biggest export markets in terms of its gas customers. Its best trajectory now under, certainly under Vladimir Putin, is to be the sort of you know junior gas supplier to China and you know possibly India. Right. That's a strategic failure. But it is, as you say, it's also shown that it's you know military is not nearly as fearsome as people thought it was. Um, big surprise. Which was a, a, a big yeah. surprise. Um, it is, however, capable of causing you know as we're seeing day in day out now immense suffering through the sort of gratuitous use of of missiles at civilian infrastructure and it has nuclear weapons and so you know there is the potential of sort of things going catastrophically worse and so it's a it's a constant i don't think these two things are inconsistent you can be you know weak and strategically have lost but still capable of inflicting tremendous damage and one of the things that one of the most interesting things i read about um vladimir putin was his his he he wrote a book um, or a book was written on the basis of his own um, interviews that he'd given early in the 2000s. And he told this story of when he was in St. Petersburg um, in the block of flats that he grew up in and he was chasing rats. You may have heard this story. And he cornered a rat and the cornered rat flew at him. And he said, this, I, you know, I took one of my most important life lessons from this. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but the behavior of the cornered rat, and that I, keeps flashing in my mind when I see what's happening in Russia, but I, I think it is a, more powerful than that is the sense in which Europe has come together, the West has come together, and yes, huge damage can still be wrought by this, by this person, by the regime he is running, but I think it is, it is damage from weakness, not in any sort of big strategic sense. Um, a victory. I thought you were going to say the wounded bear. You said the wounded rat. So you had a rat. Really there weren't, there <laughs> weren't any bears in the St. Petersburg yeah. block, apartment block. Yeah. No, but I think you know, I, I, I'm not going to repeat what you said, but the notion that when a country is in decline and feels threatened, it can be particularly dangerous makes perfect sense. I mean, what's striking is that, I'm not hearing one, one, who knows, the the escalation hasn't hasn't happened yet. The really extreme es the, the the nuclear escalation. What what is clearly trying to do now is to sort of break the Ukrainians' will by you know making life more and more miserable throughout the winter. And I I have um, you know I'm in constant touch with my colleagues who are there, and it is as I'm sure all of you are who know people. It is it's getting it's just uncomfortable and tough and you know then there's no water to be in Kiev and there's only electricity a few hours and it's just and it's just destructive wanton destruction would like to ask the next question oh my god <laughs> how does how does one choose in the white sweater there please yes yes right right here uh, there's Oh, oh, there's sorry. several people with white. Be more specific. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, the fluffy white sweater. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Keta. I'm studying social innovation and entrepreneurship here at LSC. We've talked. Thank you for the very interesting talk. And we discussed a few. We discussed few important challenges. But would you also say that one of the challenges and maybe failure of liberalism is finding the balance between economic liberalism and political liberalism? Like, talking about human rights, talking about freedom, but also continuing business as usual with countries like China, Russia. Like, where do they see the balance? Like, where is this line that we draw? Okay, this is the red line that we're not gonna cross. And like, people are discussing like World Cup in Qatar today, but like, we've seen Olympics in China, we've seen like 
World Cup in Russia back in 2018 when Russia had already occupied territories of Georgia and Ukraine. So like, when do liberals learn their lesson and then where do they draw the line and have the balance between political and economic liberalism? Thank you. Um, it's a really interesting, it's a very, very interesting question. It's a really interesting balance. I've been thinking about the whole uh, Qatar stuff quite a lot. Mm. Um, and we, I think we wrote an editorial last yes, week, you basically saying, going up against against the, the tide. Yeah, because it. I mean, I think you raise a really important point. You know, the, the notion Qatar is look, it's not a liberal democracy. Don't get me wrong, but you know, the the World Cup was held in Russia, which is you know, and the Olympic Games were held in China, and the Olympic Games were held in China. So I mean, my, I have some issues with the World Cup being in Qatar, but they have to do with you know, it's a place where it's fifty degree heat, and you've had yeah. to build. So it's it's much more the environmental stuff than it is yeah. the shortcomings on human rights but i think you also raise a broader point which is what should liberals do to make clear their um fealty to their values and therefore you know the use of sanctions is it just simply raising issues should you be imposing sanctions what should how far should you go and how do you balance that with other considerations and, and i think it's there isn't a sort of easy, simple, glib answer to that, because it, it would be easy to say, you know, the importance of human rights should trump everything. Right. But in, in, you know, politicians have to balance different things. So one example that comes to mind, which I think is a, is a particularly tough one, uh, Xinjiang is an out, you know, crime, an outrageous, outrageous behavior by the Chinese government, the oppression of the Uyghurs. Um, the United States, as you know, has imposed sanctions on Xinjiang. Xinjiang is also the place from which um, one of the key ingredients in solar panels comes. And so there is a very trade-off here. If you want to maximize the speed with which renewable energy is adopted, then you would actually import as much of this stuff as you could. And so there's a, this, and we should, you know, liberals have to grapple with trade-offs. That's the whole, you know, there, there are choices involved in these trade-offs. And I think it's, important to debate them and you can disagree where you come out on them but quite often in the discourse um people say well you know if you're a liberal and you believe in human rights then absolutely of course you should put sanctions on a b c d e f g you know and and i think sometimes it can be it can be a bit more complicated than that so i think the the tenet of liberalism that is underappreciated is the that there are you know, often different goals that might be in tension and, you know, there, you have to embrace and debate those trade-offs. Life is full of trade-offs. You heard it from the editor of The Economist. <laughs> You've also heard it from every micro teacher uh, at the SPP and it just happens to be true, right? Okay, um, Zani is going to pick the next person because I don't want to be in the position of choosing who gets the floor. So Zani, that's that's sad, that... I mean, you know, at least because I'm very short sighted. I've got my glasses on. Okay. Uh, gentleman right there, who's the tallest with the hand right up top? Yes, you. You just yes. look backwards. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Cavi. I study international health policy at LSE. Um, so you mentioned that you're an optimist, and I'd like to think of myself as one as well, but consistently from a healthcare background, um, one of the things that's most concerning to me looking forward is that mental health has become a very big issue with people in our generation. And consistently what has come up often is they're anxious about the state of the world and where it's going. Um, what I like to ask people of your generation is what gives you like hope and what looking forward gives you hope. And oftentimes the answer that they give me is your generation, talking to people in your generation, the way you guys talk about issues. Honestly, I kind of roll my eyes at that because I'm sure that the generation before you said the exact same thing, so on and so on. Right. Um, so what I'd like to ask you is, is your answer the same? And if it is the same, then what about our generation gives you so much hope? So even if it was going to be the same, it certainly wouldn't be now. I'm not going to <laughs> you roll your eyes. But actually, the answer is it isn't that. I think um, what gives me hope is both a look back at, if you look back, particularly over the last 200 years, there has been clear progress with setbacks and huge, but clear progress. And secondly, when I look at the degree of innovation that is happening now, whether it is in healthcare, whether it is in, you know, digital innovation, whether it is in, you know, even in even the most difficult areas, like how to deal with climate change, there's unbelievable amounts of innovation going on. I think we are creating the sort of tools that will be needed to make tremendous progress. And even on something like, like mental health, 
the fact that we are now talking about mental health in a way that 10, 15, 20 years ago, people did not talk about mental health is itself a sign of progress. And I'm, so my, it, it sounds like a sort of naive blind optimism, but when I just, when I look around the kinds of things that human ingenuity is achieving, it makes me confident that you know, we will actually find you know, that climate change is, is real and there are gonna be sort of terrible consequences in, in parts of the world and there's huge costs coming with it, but we are grappling with it. And I'm, I am not um, sort of, I'm, I'm optimistic that in the end, we will find ways to adapt. We will find ways to decarbonize. We will find ways to even the hard to decarbonize sectors will be decarbonized. We will find ways to undo some of the damage we've already done because human ingenuity is completely extraordinary. The same thing in healthcare. Uh, and so I'm, it's, it's not that I say, you know, your generation gives me, although that is actually also true, <laughs> but it's, it's the power of human's ability to, to recalibrate, to innovate is what gives me hope. And actually, one of the things that, you know, this is going to be the glib answer instead of your generation. Go to, I mean, I've just, I've just been in Asia. Go to, you know, as I keep telling you, just going there makes me optimistic. Sure. Um, it's very easy when you're in cold, dark London, particularly when we're now the slowest growing place in the G20, where they're kind of incapable of doing anything. You can get depressed. The, the, the rest of the world is not like that. And there are tons of people who really are trying to change it. And so, so that, would be a, that would be my other glib answer. Yeah. If I, I, I cannot refrain from adding one thought to that. It is very fashionable to be pessimistic. Um, you know, Steven Pinker has a wonderful book about this, much maligned, but I think mostly right, in which he says, pick any indicator of human welfare over the last 50 years, 100 years, you know, a thousand years, we humans, live much, much better. There's one that stuck in my mind. Uh, at sort of at the beginning of times, the chances that one human would die at the hands of other human was like one in four. Today is like one in 40 million. So, you know, most people, uh, our ancestors uh, met their death when some other human being came with a very large piece of wood and whacked them in the head, right? Uh, uh, that happens occasionally nowadays, but it happens, you know, statistically, it's just, you know, a different order of magnitude, right? It's uh, um, and so, you know, if, if, you, if you go to an intellectual cocktail party or dinner party and you say that all is well, people give you dirty looks because, you know, we're supposed to be in the business of saying that all is not well. But in many dimensions, the, that is absolutely right, I think, you know. So I need human to get progress the, I need to the head whacking over the head example. I haven't done that. My, my yeah. response tends to be when, when, when the sort of, uh, I have the, those kind of hand wringing conversations yeah. and someone says, you know, how terrible things are. And I sort of depending on their age, I then say, well, you know, you were alive in, you know, the mid 1970s. Would right. you like to go back to that? Yes. And very rarely do people say yes. Um, yeah, imagine big shoulder pads, fluffy <laughs> hair. <laughs> <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Danny, this is your job. Yeah, uh, well, I don't know. Um, lady there, left. There we go. We're trying, we've got, this is completely NVIDIA, so we're gonna to have to try and get through all of them. Okay, um, Hi, I, I, I will pick the ne next one to relieve you of the pressure. Okay. My name is Mathilde, I'm an LC alumna from the Department of Government, a devoted reader of your newspaper. And uh, I would like to bring an, another trade-off, which is that of content moderation. So I consider it to be ultimately illiberal to prevent people from saying what they want to say online, but at the same time, it is often done in the name of defending liberal values, such as preventing people from assaulting the capital as the votes are being counted. So I would like to know where you stand on that. Where is there is there a line to be drawn somewhere between what can be allowed on social media and where do we have to say, oh, this is, this should be said. Great and difficult question. Great question. And I am very much on the liberal free speech end of this, um, probably to some controversy. I think there are uh, certain things like outright incitement to violence, for example, that uh, should not be allowed. But I, you know, we argued at the time, I, I think it was a terrible mistake that Donald Trump was taken off Twitter. Um, I think it's good that he's back on again, mm -hmm. uh, or not on, or whatever he's decided to do. I think that the so I'm, I'm very much at the free speech end of this debate. I also think it's problematic that to the degree these social media platforms are becoming the, or have become the global public square that a bunch of 
you know, self-appointed people who run them can decide what is or is not a kind of area of speech. That said, as, as Elon Musk is discovering, if your business model is an advertising-led business model, then your advertisers care very much about this. So quite a lot of content moderation is driven by that. So it's in practice quite hard to do the um, very sort of freer end of the spectrum that I would be on. But my instinct is where I think from the tone of your question yours is, which is to be you know, less worried about um, uh, to, to be more skeptical of too much content moderation. I mean, I'm, I'm, that doesn't mean I think anything goes, but I, I'm, in general, I think it's, it's more problematic. I also think, one, one last thing on this, rules on content moderation are most used by authoritarian or illiberal governments to silence would-be critics. So I'm much more worried about that than I am about, you know, the, the dangerous side of having, you know, too many, too much free speech. Could you give us one example of, of when this particular issue came to your team and you decided maybe you shouldn't publish it? Uh, Ever? Never? No, not, not in terms, I mean, yes, in terms of our, so decisions of what we should publish, yes, that's what journalists are about, but that's not content moderation, it's not someone else. No, but, but imagine. Yeah, do I decide we should, you know, for example, you know, yeah, we, we're constantly making decisions about what to publish and what not to publish. You know. No, but, but on these grounds, on the on the grounds that it would be, say, inflammatory or, you know. Um, I don't know, in, inflammatory. So, you know, I have a policy about the use of um, really crude swear words. Um, and this is being, this is being, I'm not sure how many crude swear words I'm going to use on this. It's going to be used in a podcast, but my view there is that certain words are fine if they are in a direct quote, but they should not be part of our prose. Right. I mean, that's a that's a kind of um, you know, I, I it's not because it's inflammatory, but that's a sort of decision about that. Our, our journalism strives to be. I mean, we really try hard to be sort of rigorous, authoritative, but say it as it is. And so, if something has, has happened, we'll say it as it is. We're going to go to Zoom now. Caro, uh, uh, or one of you guys has a question or two from the people um, on screen. Yep. So we're going to read two questions. So, uh, one is from Kevin Ryan, LSE graduate from France. Uh, he asks, like, what's the threat does technology pose for the future of liberal democracy? Technology. Yeah. And the um, second question is from Anthony, Anthony Bajillon, uh, LSE external alum that he asked uh, if Trump uh, wins again, uh, it's the UK, Europe, and NATO ready to promote liberal democracy without the United States for another four years? <laughs> Tiny questions. <laughs> um, uh, liberal democracy under threat from technology, um, you know, I think the answer is broadly no. Um, I think that you know, technology is being much more effectively used by authoritarian regimes. I think surveillance capitalism is going a long way in China. Right. Um, uh, so I'm much more worried about that than I am about the threat to liberal democracy. Uh, that, does that, that doesn't mean that there won't be sort of challenges. That, and Technology isn't the kind of, the things can go wrong with, but broadly I believe in the benefit of technological progress rather than being scared of it. Um, if Trump wins again, I'm, 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 I honestly don't think Trump will win again. Um, but if he said it here, <laughs> doesn't seem like a winner to me right now. Uh, I think the more Dr. there is, Santos? yeah, there's, there is that there is a more sort of Trump or no Trump. There is a certain kind of MAGA republicanism, which is very different from the post-war republicanism that was part of that believed in the kind of rules-based order and American leadership of certain sorts. So I think it would be a mistake for Europe to assume that the US, notwithstanding the extraordinary role the US has played in Ukraine, which is, yeah. you know, global leadership at its finest. Um, notwithstanding that, I think it would be a mistake for Europe to assume that the US will forever be involved in the way that it has been involved for the last 70 years. I think it's quite clear that the US regards China as the main 
geopolitical threat stroke competitor um, for the coming century. And the sort of that's that's where American attention will be. And it's I think it's kind of reasonable actually for America to think that. And I think it's important for Europe to think about its own economic future. And actually, this is we for those of you who are really efficient, uh, you will have seen that our cover this week, our new cover is about precisely this. It's about Europe's future. And we're quite um worried that Europeans haven't grasp, notwithstanding the tremendous and admirable coming together to support Ukraine, the consequences of the energy shock, which will be much more lasting than one winter, um, uh, will lead to changes in Europe that I think haven't really kind of sunk in yet in Europe. And I and and and, and rethinking Europe's sort of geopolitical role is part of that. And, and if you want to be, and I am optimistic, as you can tell, you know, the transformation that's taken place in Germany, at least in Germany's political culture in the last nine months has been really dramatic. You know, they're suddenly, they've gone from a country that, I'm half German, but a country that has sort of ducked its, any sense of leadership role to now, you know, wanting to spend the 2% of GDP on defense, you know, dramatically changing its energy structure. If, if that, that all goes well for Europe's ability to survive even in a world where there isn't quite so much American leadership. Let's stay for a second on the issue of the Republican Party. You emphasize that the Republicans suddenly don't believe in the world rules-based order. That is true. You didn't say, however, but I'm sure you would agree, that part of the problem is that the Republicans don't seem to believe very much in the domestic rules-based order. I mean, there are bits of Republican politicking, which seems, to put it politely, liberal and sometimes downright undemocratic. There are, but they haven't didn't do very well in the midterms. The election denier crowd didn't do very well. So I am I'm I've always been leery of painting things quite as starkly as you did. And I'm always saying to my colleagues that we should not paint the entire Republican Party in this way. There are plenty of Republicans who believe actually in you know the fundamental tenets of democracy and there are actually still some who still believe in the traditional kind of republican but the center of gravity has certainly shifted but one thing that's important i think is it's not just the republicans actually you know, the biden administration's approach to china is remarkably similar to that of the, of the trump administration that a and, or a bad thing? well the u.s is basically what the u.s has decided is that a combination of a proliferation, so weaponization of its economic power, whether it's sanctions, whether it's export controls, all kinds of things which are antithetical to the old rules-based order, but it's using that stuff. At the same time, a dramatic industrial policy and subsidization at home. And the US now spends more money on subsidies broadly than France. Dirigiste France is, right. is, you know, spends less than the US does. Those two together are a very big shift. Sure away from you know, what we thought multilateralism was about. And I think the big question for the next 10 years is whether this is going to pay off. And, and one, and it's tough if you believe in free trade, like you and I, and all of you, no doubt, it's a, it's a sort of hard thing to get your head around, but there is a logic that says the United States is, is sort of pushing China back five years or so. It's using that time through a massive industrial policy to accelerate its own climate transition to accelerate its reindustrialization and to thereby assuage all those people who'd given up on globalization who were the fodder for, for trump and the populists now i'm i'm not sure i believe that it's as coherent as that but there is a logic to this and and so i think that's the bet that the us is taking i hope the democrats a do it and b get it right but uh, it's tough Okay, we have time made for a couple more questions. Um, I'm going to choose the very last time at the very end there. Yes, sir. Yes, you. Um, there's a microphone coming your way. Hi, I'm Donato, and I'm studying political sociology, master degree. More than a question, I have a provocation. And, uh, oh, good. I like this. Oh, nice. <laughs> and talking about mental issue, uh, mental health, I want to apologize Apologize in advance. I'm Asperger, so perhaps I need some time to take this into account. I'm very happy to be in a, how someone said, in a perspective uh, 
technocracy uh, university, but I feel like uh, I am the chain between us and them. What I mean is, I come from a, a low social income family. My father was, um, who is not here anymore, was a um, factory worker. My mother, she's a cleaner. I, unluckily, I'm Italian as well. <laughs> and as you can see, what's going on back home. And the old friend of mine uh, are populist, neo fascist, uh, machist people, which I took distance from. And I'm studying here to change the situation, to understand what's going on in there. What I realize to fight populism, I think we should, everyone should fight the little populism which lies in itself. If populism is a dichotomy, as Karl Mude said, everyone said, between us and them, to start to fight populism, the challenge I think should be speak with the people you don't want to speak. Go speak with the fascists, go speak with the racists, go speak with the everybody, and don't simply judge them from an ivory tower perspective, because if they know they are in a bad shape. Ask them, how can I help you? What's going on in your life? Why you are racist? That's how to fight populism. Otherwise, it's like fi uh, fight the fire with fire. You are populist as well, but you have not still realized that. So I hope it, what do you think about that? Liberals hang out only with liberals. Maybe, that's maybe that's a very yeah. bad. Yeah. I mean, I completely yeah. agree with that yeah. with yeah. you. That that you never make progress simply by talking to like-minded people in a cozy yeah. group of similar people. And I, I'll give you it's it's not nearly such a, a a powerful example as your one. But I a few years ago we had a conference at the Economist. Uh, we hosted a conference in New York as part of our part of the celebration of our 175th anniversary called the Open Future Conference. And I invited and just had a conversation like this with on stage, Steve Bannon, mm -hmm. to right. huge outrage. I mean, you know, huge, huge outrage. I had to publish an explanation. And I really felt strongly that it was important to engage in debate. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, there was virtually nothing that he and I agree on, but it was, in, in, I thought important. I mean, if we just had a bunch of liberals around saying how marvelous liberalism was, that that wasn't really going to... What surprised you most of what he said? He's super clever. I mean, I don't, has he, has he gone, has he, he's gone to jail, hasn't he? Yeah, I don't know, but he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a very, very clever man. He read The Economist. He's a very, very close reader of The Economist. He's funny. You can, you, he, you can watch it on YouTube and you'll see that many people think that he got the better of the debate. Um, he, he's, a, he's a super smart person. I mean, I want... I, he and he uses arguments very effectively, and it was it was really good for me actually. I'm I'm I still am very glad that we did it. And and I, there were the arguments made against the sort of serious arguments where you're you're giving a platform to someone who is beyond the pale. You shouldn't give him a platform. Well, he had just left the White House at this point. He was you know he was someone who had been whether we liked it or not in an extremely influential position. I thought that was a nonsense argument. I mean, there are people who are beyond the pale who you should not give a platform to, right. of course, but I didn't think he was one of them. Should the LSE invite Steve Bannon to give a talk here? <laughs> if you think yes, raise your hand. Okay. Made a persuasive case. Well, it's, I mean, it's <laughs> in 2022, after he's been you know, charged with all manner of things, it's slightly different yes, of than course. 2018. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, one third said yes. Without that, maybe sixty percent. But I would do have said think yes. more broadly, yeah. you should, yeah. you should. Yeah. And I think this is now. I'm going to really get into trouble, but I do think this is a bit of a problem with universities oh, right now, where there absolutely. is an unwillingness to engage in debate with with sort of people deemed off limits, and uh, I think that's a, a real problem. I think that's we we need to engage in debate with people with whom we disagree. I could not agree more. I'm also going to get into trouble. Uh, all right. Um, my God, we have exactly three minutes. Um, the woman in the black there. Yes, please. Right there. Yes. Hi, 
Hi, uh, my name is Fatima. I'm in the Geography and Environment Department studying for an MSc in Environment and Development here at the LSE. And I want to be one of those people tonight who say all is not well. Um, I want to go back to the tenets um, you mentioned, uh, progress and individual freedom, limited governments, and considering the very urgent environmental crises that we face, what do you have to say about the tendency of liberals to broadly ignore um, these crises other than to seemingly justify and keep the system intact? So what do you think the direction is going to be for liberalism, especially uh, considering um, its idea of progress? Thank you. Particularly with the to the climate crisis. So I guess I don't completely agree with you in that what is clearly true is that collectively the world has made less progress than it should have done in addressing the challenge of climate change and it took far too long for governments to really take this seriously and to to make progress um that said i think that we are seeing an acceleration of action and we are more importantly seeing an explosion of innovation which i think will make progress and i think one of the one of the challenges for and i'm i'm sort of surmising given your question this is where you're coming from one of the challenges that people who are rightly and understandably focused on the urgency of the climate change have to grapple with is what do you say to the billions of people who have insufficient energy in the developing world who want to have an improved life and who frankly have every right to have an improved life uh, and you see it in the you know, particularly in Africa, you see it in parts of Asia. I mean, you, you, it is hard to say to the people in those countries, uh, sorry, you can't have, you know, electricity because it's a coal-fired power plant, or sorry, you can't have any investment in your uh, gas fuel, which is, you know, exactly what the Europeans have done in Africa. You know, there's this, there was a um, prohibition on funding uh, gas fuel power generation. I think it's just very, very hard for, for us to do that. And I think it's perfectly reasonable that people want to have, you know, the things that we will now take for granted in terms of a sort of more prosperous life. And so the challenge, and I, this is why I'm, I end up being quite optimistic, is we will rely on the ingenuity of human innovation, which is happening and we're seeing, and we see, look at, look at, Britain becoming a global leader in offshore wind. It's happened in the last 10 years. There wasn't really any offshore wind 10 years ago. Now Britain's a global leader. You're seeing a huge drive for renewable power, huge investment in India. India is one of the most you know, coal polluting countries in the world. Suddenly there's a recognition actually that climate matters and it's in India's interest to invest massively in renewable power and it's happening. And I think we, are, we will see that happening more and more. And we'll end up with a world where yes, you know, the climate temperatures will rise more than would be absolutely ideal. Therefore, there will need to be more adaptation. Therefore, there will still need to be areas where we've got to innovate, whether it's carbon sequestration. There are still lots to be done. But I, I sense that as the visible manifestations of climate change, floods, hurricanes, become more evident, so that pace accelerates. And we just need to do it in a way that acknowledges that there are still huge numbers of people in the world who need energy and we have to find ways to get them energy in a sustainable way. But that conversation is beginning to happen. And, and so I'm you know, actually much less downbeat than, than in, in fact, many of my colleagues on this. I think that if, you're, if your yardstick is, you know, can we stop global warming in its tracks? No. We're, we're seeing temperatures rise, and I think we're going to go beyond 1.5 degrees. Will humanity be able to adapt you, you to that? You a fairly pessimistic story on this just 10 days ago. Yeah, but I don't think, it, I mean, I think it was a realistic story. I don't think it was necessary. you know, it depends what your benchmark is. I think humanity can adapt to living in a world that's higher than 1.5 degrees. Does it mean that some low-lying islands will, you know, be underwater? Probably yes, but is it, uh, and does that make me sort of hard hearted? No, but I think it's a it's a world to get back. It's a world of trade offs. And 
I think I sense that we are making progress. Would in an ideal world, would I wish that the world would wake up and adopt a carbon tax overnight and we suddenly could use all of our things that you know economists like to have and we had incentives, proper incentives? Yes, of course I would wish that. But I think we're moving in the right direction. And I think a few things have happened this year, not least the tremendous money, amount of money that the US is now pouring into its ill-named Inflation Reduction Act, which yes. is a huge amount yes. of subsidies for innovation. I, I'm very encouraged by what's happening in India, yeah. um, where really there's money being plunged into renewables. Indonesia, another big emerging market, yeah. seeing itself as the you know, potential Saudi Arabia of, of cobalt and all the minerals that you right. need for yeah. renewable energy. Yeah. Stuff is happening. So it's not happening probably fast enough, but I don't, I'm not, I don't feel that it's a kind of defeat. And I think we, we have to do it in a way that ensures that people who have every, who have aspirations to you know, higher income, are, are able to get that too. Well, my mother taught me that one should always end a conversation on an optimistic note. And <laughs> Zani has just provided exactly that optimistic note. Um, I guess, uh, you know, liberalism is facing some challenges, but uh, not all is lost. And the world is rising, uh, is facing rising temperatures, but certainly not all is lost. And on that note, please join me in giving our guests a huge round of applause.